Thank you guys very much. I'm Team Skeptic. I already introduced myself. I am the killer of bad ideas. I uh, seek out bad ideas like self-entitlement. Uh, I seek out bad ideas like people that uh, don't believe in science. And I, I absolutely do my best to prove that those people have no idea what they're talking about and why they have no idea what they're talking about. Right. Do I introduce myself now? Absolutely. So I'm Sean Fitzgerald. I don't know which one of these cameras is on. Or is this just for... Oh, both of them. Yeah. So I can say hi over here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. That I can see the lens. Uh, so uh, I run a YouTube channel called The Actual Justice Warrior. I cover criminal justice related topics primarily. But I also cover a bunch of other things that are in the news and related to like different like current events or whatever. Um, I, I would say that I like the science. I'm not against it. <laughs> um, and, but we have to find something to argue about in order to make this entertaining. So, like, you got to give me some more specifics, and then maybe I can... Well, okay, like, I was having the discussion earlier that I believe that police auditing is, is necessary. But today's police auditor is a threat to the First Amendment. No, like, how do you mean? Well, we, as I was saying in, in, uh, to these guys right here, that... Uh, you know, right now we have we start out before there is a constitution. We start out with just completely inalienable rights. Okay, we all can say what we want to say. We we can murder each other because there's no government, there's no society, there's no nobody to say what is right or what is wrong. There's just simply you and your rights. Right? There's nothing to say that you can't. So eventually, society forms, and then laws come in to say that to say this is not wrong. This cannot. This is bad for society. So we start losing our rights based on the, these laws. Right now, our First Amendment and our right to freedom of speech, I won't cover freedom of thought or freedom of religion because it's really not those aspects that I'm worried about. Right. Those aspects will be attacked by the attacking of the original First Amendment purpose, which is to redress our government and have the right to speak our mind without fear for, from repri reprisal from our government. Excuse me. So uh, today's First Amendment auditor will go up and literally jump in the face of a police officer to incite a reaction. Okay, this is not about the First Amendment. This is about a YouTube video making clicks and views and making a living out of it. Now, we've, we, when we try to distinguish between someone who's truly fighting for the First Amendment and someone who's doing it as a profit, a lot of times these people that are doing it for profit are not holding consistent values with what the Founding Fathers needed right. for, for the First Amendment, how it should apply. So my fear is that the, the Supreme Court will eventually have to step in one day on a, a big case. There will actually be a case where a First Amendment auditor will get a serious injury or death, and they're going to have to come in and say, is this really what the First Amendment is all about? Should we, stop, should we start taking away the, the idea that every citizen is an actual journalist? Because if we allow every citizen to consider themselves a journalist, this is how having non-licensed, like we can't allow doctors and lawyers to be, we can't allow non-licensed people to be doctors and lawyers. Do we say, can we not allow non-licensed people to be journalists because they're, you know, they're doing things improperly and causing danger to society? And that'll limit us. Go ahead. But like the doctor or lawyer has a specialized skill. And I want, I want to like address something. You don't actually have the right to kill somebody up until a law is created. The whole point of natural rights and natural law is that you have freedom up until the point where you're infringing on somebody else's rights. So you can't contradict somebody else's rights. So that's why all the negative rights is what they're called when people argue negative and positive rights are just things that don't infringe on other people, like up until the point. So you have freedom of speech, of course, because- Why do I have the freedom to kill an animal and, and use it as food? No, well, animals aren't people. Like, rights are for people. But I'm still taking the life of something. That's still my right. I right? mean, look, we can get into a vegan argument if like- No, 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 I'm not, not vegan. vegan. I'm not- to ruin my yeah, day. Yeah, I'm just saying, I believe it to be a right. No, it, it, it's well, immoral. I'll, I'll agree with you. I mean, immoral, a, a, lot of, a lot of rights come from, like a lot of the philosophical basis of rights are like endowed by the creator. Like I'm not particularly religious. But like if you're going for like if you're going for that justification that's literally in the Declaration of Independence and like the, in the Christian Bible, it's like man has dominion over the animals, which is why we don't consider ex some people do, but we don't consider extending rights to animals. But typically in terms of a negative rights framework, your rights go and up until a point where they conflict with somebody else's, which is why you have freedom of speech, which is why you have like freedom of expression, you have your property rights and and all these other things because they don't infringe your justly acquired property rights. They don't infringe on other people's rights inherently. And then things like murder violate somebody else's right to life. And, you know, that's why you can defend yourself from a murder with it by well, killing somebody. Well, in society, right. But, but I'm saying pre-society. I'm, I'm saying, saying that's when like, society does not exist, there is no 
moral moral ground for to justify not murdering somebody when let's say murdering that well, person the, could feed your dog. Well, the the, the that what, you love. The, the moral like the, the moral framework that we have these natural rights comes before they're codified in the Constitution. I mean, so, I agree with you. So, the, there's a morality yeah. issue to it. And I'm saying let's ignore the morality say, to say we do have that right to do this if we feel that it extends our life. I have a right to life. If, if, I, get on, if I get find myself in a situation where it co literally comes down to me having to murder somebody else and eating them or they having to murder me to eat me, then I believe that's a right that they – that's a justified right regardless of the morality well, of the choice. Well, that's why they actually, in those situations, they say that you have to like draw straws to figure yeah, out who yeah. dies and all that because y your right can't conflict with one another. Obviously, that's like a very niche like situation, but it is a hypothetical for a reason. But that's what they would say. You'd leave it up to chance, and like that doesn't really sound like a great like solution. I understand that. But in general, the idea is the rights supersede their codification and it's it's like they refer to it as natural law as in it predates right. government and if you read like the first amendment or any of the amendments it's kind of reflected in that it's congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the speech or press i forget right. which order it's in but it establishes that thing as something that pre-exists government mm -hmm. so like that's like the little issue i have with like it's not that nothing well, none that's of these an extreme rules. issue let's just right. hold it to the first amendment let's hold it to freedom of speech right let's say pre-government okay pre-society i could just walk out and say whatever i wanted we were, in a, we're in a theater, I can walk in and go fire and watch all the people run out and trample each other and I, that's my, my enjoyment, it's my well, right. I mean, the fire in the crowded theater decision has been thrown out by the Supreme no, Court. I understand, but, like I, but you, you understand yeah. the, the, the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. Okay, so eventually they have to start limiting people from being able to to do things that would incite violence right. or incite danger. Upon well, it's like people. direct and it's like direct calls to violence, not like, Correct. you know, like vague. But, incite. but, but. It is illegal, right? To directly yeah. go. Why is it illegal? Who made it illegal? Uh, the government. Okay, exactly. So the government has started restricting our rights. But we, we can agree on that at least, right? Yeah. That, I mean, okay. if, if you're talking about like an absolute, I get to say anything without consequences. Then yeah, in that regard, we have a we have restrictions. Okay, so the restrictions have already started to fall down and fall into place based right. on the actions of individuals who were doing. Right. Like if nobody <laughs> ever yelled, and we're going to use the fire in a theater. Example, but even though we, we just talked about how that's not really still thing, the it's, idea it's, it's is also the concept, film, film right? isn't made with like those silver nitrates that are so <laughs> flammable anymore. Well, the, well the, movie, the movie theaters aren't like that dangerous. Like they used to be a horrible fire trap. Yeah, but the, the idea is that it's inciting speech, yeah. right? It's inciting. So if nobody ever incited violence towards anybody else ever, there would have never been a law put in place that says right. you are not allowed to incite violence on it started out when people started inciting violence and going that's not protected speech right. you cannot do this because you're violating yeah, the they're rights considered of other people. fighting words or, or right. something so like that. we do have we do have examples of where our right to freedom of speech has been limited yeah. by the actions of others now these people and anybody can go in and look at them online they are antagonizing police simply for views, clicks, and money. Right. Now, they go up to the cops and they start yes, problems with them. Yes. And they're like, I'm, you should be able to film the cops, but these people are just being jerk-offs right. is what you're saying. Exactly. And, and, and the, when uh, the Founding Fathers wrote the, the Constitution and, and those amendments, the idea was to keep what was happening in America at the time with Great Britain, to keep that from happening with the people from the government of America. Right. To keep America from, the government of America from becoming tyrannical like we were dealing with at the time. It's the whole reason why the amendments are written the yeah. way they are. It's from their, their frame of reference. It's a deconstruction of a monarchy. That's why right. it requires two-thirds of the legislative branch to declare war because typically that is a power held exclusively by the executive, which was the monarch and is the president in our thing. Yeah. So the purpose then of the Supreme Court moving forward is to approve or not approve amendments and, and adjustments to these bills because though that's what their job is. Their job is to interpret that for us since we don't have, we as the people, the generalized people, there might be people like yourself that have a little bit better legalese than I would, but the Supreme Court is supposed to be there to justify or not justify actions of certain people. And if the like unjustification is a result of the wording of the First Amendment or the wording of the Constitution or the wording of amendments, then they go in and they change that. Now, when they change that, they never give you more rights. Never have you been given more rights. You've always had rights taken away. Now, maybe civil rights. We'll talk about the Civil Rights Acts and stuff like that for the disparity of, of how we were treating you know, people of color back in the 60s and 50s and whatnot. 
there were things written to give them more rights, to give them rights that they deserve that were taken away from them previously, and that I can agree with. But in general, the Supreme Court, any amendment is there to reduce your rights, and these guys will eventually be written, have the, the Constitution or the, the Supreme Court will eventually see a case, but they're going to have to make a justification on that person's actions. And when they say that person's actions are not justified, this is not what was meant by the First Amendment, they're going to write new laws around that. And it's not going to be a law for that guy. It's going to be a law for all of us. And then we lose more of our freedom of speech. And that's important to hold as much of it as possible. In fact, it's so important that we should be fighting for more of it. We don't need to be restricted. We should not be restricted on YouTube. We should not be restricted on Twitter. Why restrict bad ideas? Let people like me take the bad ideas and deconstruct them and show you why they're bad in a way that you can digest and understand. We push them away. They go somewhere else. They foster those bad ideas under umbrellas. That's, we can't see them. And then January 6th happens. Right. Um, so... Like, I agree with you in general that, like, yeah, I don't, that, that there's a lot of restrictions that come against our rights. But, like, in terms of, like, the specifics, when you're like, the Supreme Court has never uh, expanded the rights of the First Amendment. When the First Amendment was established, we were a much more socially conservative society. Mm -hmm. So we had laws against, um, I, I forgot what the exact word is, but I think it might be smut, like, being published and all these different things, like, you know, very sexually restrictive. There's very famous Supreme Court cases where they've like gotten rid of those laws. Hustler Magazine was involved in one of those cases. Okay. I believe that Playboy was involved. So it's not necessarily true that they don't expand the First Amendment. Like the founders were passing laws against like against like things like smut and all that because it was a way more religious time. And back in the day, we didn't have the reverse incorporation clause. So even though the federal government couldn't restrict restrict your speech. The state governments were allowed to up until when the 14th Amendment was passed, and then reverse incorporation doctrine has been expanded over the years yeah. to more apply the Constitution. So I get, like, your general premise. I think the specifics aren't, like, as accurate as they no, should be. No, you're right. You're right. But, like, yeah, I don't want more restrictions. I like the idea of being able to contradict, like, things that I don't like. And not even because I think that in this, like, holy grail world, like, the best ideas will rise to the top. That's the hope. But I think freedom of speech is a good in and of itself even if it leads to bad out, bad outcomes, because it's like principally, you can speak, therefore you have the right to speak, just like you can think, therefore you have the yeah, right to think. Yeah, freedom of thought. Like, and that goes beyond whether or not we have good or bad outcomes. A lot of people like to you know, say, oh, well, if this person is allowed to speak, and then in five years we're gonna be like Nazi Germany. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, even if that were true, that's not a good justification to like, pro, like preemptively restrict their speech, in my opinion. So I see a problem on YouTube with like, uh, and th this is where I see the government heading, okay? So when I cover an anti-vax video on YouTube, a lot of times I'll get penalized because I'm covering the anti-vaxxer. Even though I'm pro-science, I'm pro-vax, I'm here to, to promote what YouTube wants me to promote, right. but they don't know the difference, so they restrict my freedom of speech. They fr and it's not, they don't owe me anything. I'm not, I'm not dumb right. enough to think my First Amendment right applies all the way to YouTube, because it doesn't. Right. That's just my First Amendment right only applies to the government. I can still bitch about the censorship, but they owe me nothing. Right. So there's no point in saying and trying to make a First Amendment argument. But I can see where YouTube is already doing this. Any major corporation already has to understand that throwing umbrellas on top of, of problems of misinformation requires throwing an umbrella on top of positive information as well. Right. And it's really a bad thing for us to even try to remotely hide a good idea just because you're scared of the bad idea. I mean, again, we're supposed to be fighting, but I do agree we're not with you. Fight. I, I, do, I, do, I do agree with you. Um, the, the, the idea that like, because they have these policies, like a big one is that drug that like, uh, you know, the media calls horse dewormer that YouTube specifically yeah. says you can't say, which is why I'm not saying it, not because I'm a child. Uh, <laughs> it's it, it, that you can't, even if you're against it, or even if you're like, hey, this is like a treatment for other things, like, you can't do that on YouTube. It's it's ridiculous. And I don't think it, they're very much acting as a blunt instrument. And the problem you're experiencing is similar to the problem that people who made videos about Holocaust denial ended yeah. up experiencing. Where they're, since they're talking about the Holocaust or something uh, serious, they end up getting restricted and treated like the denier. If they play clips of something, 
they end up getting treated like that person. Like I've had that issue where yeah. I'll respond to a fully monetized video. Do you believe? Do you believe the government government will follow suit in those yeah, type of well, actions? Well, a, lo- a, a lot of what we're finding out. First of all, like YouTube policies in America that they're doing on the corporate level are very similar to policies being pushed and advocated mm-hmm. for by countries like in the EU or Australia and all that, where they don't have the First Amendment that protects like the very specific things that are protected in the United States. So they are kind of following suit with government. There's also (coughs) government pressure. Like, why do you think they drag all these CEOs to testify before Congress? Like, there's nothing valuable being gained. It's so that they can yell at them and then, ironically, throw those clips up on places like YouTube and Twitter to raise money off of it. But they're doing (coughs) that to intimidate them. Like, you fix this. You comply with what we want. And I think that, like, ends up making a situation where they're... They're essentially like censoring on behalf of the government without the government saying it. Yeah. And uh, on top of that, it's it, that's also unconstitutional. There's something called uh, chilling free speech in, in uh, U.S. doctrine, where if you don't make something explicitly illegal, but you make attempts through government power to <coughs> get harder for it to be done, that's considered chilling free speech, and it's actually right. unconstitutional. So like excessive permitting requirements right. and all this stuff, you're not allowed to actually do that. So... I think they're in violation of that when you have, you know, representatives and senators and even the president like saying, hey, Facebook, get this stuff off of your websites and all that. I think that crosses the threshold of corporate actors to government influencing corporate actors, even if you don't have a literal exact policy. So, like, I I think that's a huge problem. And I'm like very worried about that. And not just because I make my money on YouTube. Yeah. Well, I do, too. And that's a it's a concern for me. And it's not not because I don't think I could translate that into something else, because I know I could. But, you know, the, the idea of, of taking away the biggest platform in the world for people to find out information and restricting the information that goes into it is by the worst thing you can do for a society to move forward. Because guess what? Parlor exists now. And Rumble does. And everywhere else where they don't have these big, big followings yet, big enough for the government to step in and start saying, hey, you know, right now we need Amazon to step in, right, and pull the... Pull the, the, the server from them if they want to stop them. You know, that's the only protection you have against those bad ideas. And, and, the, and Amazon can do it, but I don't want to see the government do it. I don't want to see them running off to a, a, a hiding ground and doing domestic terrorist ideas. We lose. As a people, we lose. No matter where you sit on a political aisle, you should never want the far, any side, trying to gain control. Because all they want, they're fanatical about their ideas. And it's also like if you're one of those people who worries about collusion in the government uh, or collusion in the market, because Parler, you mentioned, which we don't have anymore, it was taken down yeah. when Amazon Web Services pulled it. It's not like Gab, which just like keeps coming back because Andrew Torba is like very, right. he's, he has, Andrew Torba, I've, I've spoken to him, he really does have a solid plan for keeping his website up. Like once all the lights go out and the zombies start rising, Gab will still be up there. Like that's how well <laughs> planned out this man has it. But um Parler was not responsible for January 6th. No, I don't Most, think it no, was. No, no, I'm just, just saying, that but the, the, the premise that, that Amazon used to basically violate the contract that they had with that company was that they were responsible for this attack, and it was put out in the, by government officials and by other social media companies that they were responsible. The bulk of this was organized on Twitter and on Facebook. Like, you can see the Facebook, the evidence of the Facebook groups. Parler had very little involvement because Parler was, like, not... Like, it was not that popular. It was popular among a niche crowd, but it wasn't that popular. And in fact, one of the ways that the FBI has been tracking these people down is because Parler enables your location data, like, all the time. And that's what ended up leading to the tracking down of a lot of these people. So, yeah, I... Well, when I say the January 6th, I'm using that as as an exemplary incident, you know, to say this is what can happen when you allow... When you push bad ideas out of the mainstream and into uh, secondary... Uh, forms of media. Yeah, and you can get growth of like certain groups. Like I remember early in the Obama administration, there was a big obsession about the increase in like hate groups in the United States. And my favorite news story of all time is that the Ku Klux Klan was like, well, we have to fight the race war. So we're going to start uh, allowing Catholics in, which they never did. So it's like weirdly Obama <laughs> made the Klan more tolerant. Which I always, I always find amusing. Made the Klan more tolerant. That's yeah, awesome. they're like, oh, it used to be the Catholics were the big problem in there. But yeah, they're like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. We have to fight the war. But um, yeah, no, like that, that is what happens when they're out of the mainstream. And there's some form of social marginalization that's good. Like yeah. I don't like deplatforming, and I probably would advocate for um, very unsavory characters having a platform. But like 
that doesn't mean that you have to associate with them. Like we're in a modern day uh, debates like thing. They don't have to bring every single person on. Yeah. But I remember uh, I attended CPAC, and just to go to your point about how you end up creating this alternative and honestly hyping them up. And Nick Fuentes shows up to CPAC every single year, right? And he brings his little like twelve year olds like with him, and they try to storm CPAC, and he gets kicked out because he can't even get a ticket at CPAC. Now CPAC so- sells itself, and this is where I do agree with him. They sell himself, themselves that year as uncanceled, right? They have no speakers outside of President Trump who have been banned on anything. Oh. This dude is, like, banned on Airbnb, like, Uber, banned from banks. He's banned from, like, things, like, I didn't even know existed, and they're, like, minor service websites. He's banned from everything. He's got Nick Fuentes. Yeah. When, like, he's a, he's a serious dude. But he sets up an organization, because, uh, like, a little, little event, a counter event across the street. And I don't know if you know anything about CPAC. It's boring as hell. So we go over there. There's no air conditioner, Dallas, Texas, uh, in the middle of July. Uh-huh. So it's 98% humidity. No air conditioner, high temperature. He packs that room for his speech. Yeah. Full hour and a half. And a lot of that is like, yes, he's a smart guy. He can build an audience. Like, you, got, you can't, like, people think I disagree with this person. Therefore, like, I have to call him stupid or anything. None of that's true with him. But part of that is... Even the people who are supposedly against canceling cancel this man. Like, and that's why a lot of people go over there and listen to him. Yeah. So you end up bolstering him. And he has a dedicated following. Like, it's, not, it's not a joke. And you see that, you see that in modern day, um, modern day uh, uh, political pundits as well. That like Steven Crowder, he constantly gets banned off of, yeah, off of uh, YouTube or suspended. Yeah, suspended yeah. off YouTube. But then again, he turns around and has his mug club and all his videos yeah. on there. And they, his fans are flocking there to watch yeah. him. Now there, he's uncensored, completely, and I'm okay with that. I'm really am okay with that. Whether you believe him and believe in his way of thinking or not, that's on you. I'm not even going to express whether I believe it or not because it's really no, nobody's business. Just like it's not my business to know y'all's viewpoints on his material. But you see it there too, you know. And you, and when, where do we draw the line that these people? Not, and I don't want to say like Stephen Crowder's a lot like this, but you do see a lot of the fundamental crowds. Where do we draw the line that some of these fundamental political parties that are forming in the undergrounds on both sides to not be cults. I mean, we're, you're starting to see leaders coming out of them and people religiously following them and, and being uh, exonerated from their families and, and, you know, and just completely separate. Q, the Q conspiracy people, they've lost family over, over yeah. beliefs in Q. When do we, we start? How did that blow up? You know, like YouTube regularly pushes that off of their thing. You can't find pro Q videos on there. Where, how, how are people finding them? Well, they're getting them through secondary media. So what you're saying is there's an untapped market I should be tapping into. <laughs> untapped go, market. I should go pro Q and No, but no. <laughs> right. so I, I, hate, I hate the overuse of the term cult because what's, what, what, is, what ends up happening, and I recently made a video about this because one of these, uh, and I won't name them because it's not relevant, one of these like men's guru guys, mm-hmm. like people were like, oh my God, he's charging $100 a month for his organization. And I made a video, like, not necessarily defending him because he was in the wrong in one of these <laughs> situations, but defending that idea because what's, in the, what's happening is a lot of people are looking for, like, community. They're looking for, like, a group, like, in order to associate with to replace organizations, groups, and communities right. that they feel have been lost. And one of the ways that you can really, like, join a group, and cults do use this, is a form of like shared sacrifice. You have to contribute something, and like lose right. something in order to gain something. This is why the army brings you, like brings you down before they build you up into an overall whole. And like you look at the bond of the of soldiers returning from war. It's like one of the strongest bonds that we have. These guys are always in each other's business because they went through that shared sacrifice together. Yeah. And another way that that could work is money. So you're not only when you're like marginalizing these people and removing them from like these free platforms because like the community is stronger based on shared sacrifice. So if they have to pay, that becomes their shared sacrifice, thus making their community stronger. You're actually making them stronger because you're incentivizing them to participate in that behavior. Right. So like, I think that's a huge problem and like a great organizations that you can look at for this are fraternities. Once they started cracking down on hazing and fraternities and sororities, they didn't get better what ended up happening was fraternities and sororities started like just not like phasing out of existence because that hazing did build them Here's up. What like, brought you, I'm, a, I'm in a fraternity. Okay, I went through hazing when I was at, at the University of Texas. Um, I've recently went to a twenty. I think it was twenty or twenty five years. 
let's see, it was 96 to 21, so what is that, 25 years, 25 years, uh, my reunion with those guys. And when we got there, I was like, Where, where's the pledges at, you know? Let's go haze them. And they were like, you can't haze them anymore. You can't yell at them anymore. You can't look them in the eyes anymore and be angry. And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with society? We, we're, we're raising up marshmallows. We're raising up, and it shows. Go look, at the, go look at the analytics on videos. Go look at what's popular. You know, we're raising human marshmallows. And it's okay. I'm okay with it. But the, the irony of that is that while those old organizations are dissipating and like you remove them from these free, free platforms where they would not form these tight-knit communities, when you force people out and then the most dedicated go over there, you're forming those new type of yeah. like organizations. They're not as productive as like a fraternity or, or any of these groups. And they're like with the people that you're worried about the most. So you might cut off somebody from like their 100,000 subscribers and be like, yeah, I nailed it. But then they have more financial support from like the 2,500 that end up paying them. And all of those people are super dedicated. And those are the kind of people who are going to come out and not just stand in a room with 98% humidity and no air conditioning. But those are the kind of people that if they're like, hey, you know, let's go after this person, they're going to go after them. So you're creating oh, yeah, yeah. a more radical type. Because like a lot of these people in the audience, I got to talk to a lot of them, they feel like this creator that got canceled is getting canceled for saying what I believe, so he's brave enough. So they're, they already have that connection. Like you're building this person up in such a way that I don't think it's worth it overall. And even, in, even if it is worth it overall, if you want to make that argument, I don't think principally it's a really good idea. Yeah, but I'd still rather, I'd rather them be in the forefront. I'd rather say let's just let them be in the forefront so we can have that discussion and we can show why they're... Because you know what? They're going to get more people. That's what's going to happen. We get the Streisand effect again. Yeah. That will occur because then this relatively unknown person who says one crazy thing and we push him off and we say don't do that and then now all his like he's at 2500 followers they're telling their buddies that guy I told you about that you never listened to me for guess what he's got banned on YouTube for what he was saying can you believe that what where's he at now he's over here go go check him out look him up he's like this and gives you the, the address and now guess what that's another follower right there that's also a person who's being pulled out of a mainstream source of, of information that can be more um, and more informative, more professional, more correct, and not so emotionally driven, trying to separate you uh, from your support systems and take advantage of you as a, as a person who um, is in an emotional need. Yeah. It's, like, it's like if uh, you heard a porn star got banned from Pornhub, you'd be like, yo, what was in her last video? Yeah. Like, you no would want to know no for doubt. sure. Right. Like, yeah. You're like, don't they allow almost anything? So it's... it's the, Where's she at now? Yeah, exactly. You know, where, where I found this video is, is, at? Is that video on Red Tube? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Not that Turn I know. Turn off safe search results. <laughs> Not that I know what any of these websites are, uh, but yeah, they it it really does create like a stronger knit community, and I think that's a huge issue. And again, we agree on it. We got to fight over something. Um, <laughs> so let me. Okay, well then let me ask you the original premise of the debate, and then let's see where you go from there. Do you think that the actions, as I described them, let's say the the run the overt running up to police officers, throwing, so do you think that offers a danger to the First Amendment? To mine and your right to freedom of speech. So essentially, like these people would, would um, they would become such a problem because they're not actually recording them. They're interfering with the police that we would get legislation to yes. stop them. That yes. would, in effect, be effective against journalists. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I don't. I don't think those people should be doing that. Like, I, I, I agree with filming the police, but you don't need to be like in the incident. Absolutely, like, that's a problem. You should film the police. Yeah. I'll, I'll say it right here to the camera. You should film the police. But what you shouldn't do is interfere with their traffic stop. You shouldn't interfere with their investigation. You shouldn't show up at their homes when they're not in oh, the, the, uh, the, um, doing their job as, a, as your political representative. That's what their job is to do, is to represent you, to protect you. These are social constructs that we as a people, have, we, we live in a social democracy where we vote these people in to make those decisions in, as for us in, in a majority. We can't just take the minority and say, well, the minority, they got it right. But they're still the minority. So and let's just make their policy. That's not how America works. And if you're a police officer, like the body cameras were meant to be this big like social change and accountability for police right. officers. It's helped them in, I want to say, 95% of the cases. There was that famous like evidence bag. Oh, they planted drugs on there where the guy was filming with the cell phone. And by the way, his phone was up a lot longer in the body cam footage. 
he just conveniently put out that video with like, it was only 10 seconds where the cops supposedly planted evidence on him without explanation. And you hear on the body cam video, he's like, look, this is blowing away in the wind. It was in your friend's pocket. I'm putting it right in the back seat right here. He's like, I know this is not yours. And this guy puts up this video and a bunch of people take it as like a, you know, police planning evidence. So the body cams are great for police officers yes. overall. Like they're, and it's good for us. Especially those ones where they press it and it starts the recording 30 seconds early. Yeah. Because there is that video of that one cop that did plant evidence and then he runs and he up. he didn't realize yeah, that there didn't, was a 30, didn't realize second, that's the a 30 second recording with no sound. Yeah. yeah. So overall, like, they're wonderful for, for everybody involved and specifically the officers. Like, they've really benefited from that. And it allows us to audit some of their, like, activity because sometimes police lying is misconstrued. Because we all don't have perfect memories and right. we kind of fill right. in the gaps. So sometimes you get like the vague outlines of a story from an officer and like a police report is always written from their perspective. But the footage doesn't most of the time lie, obviously special exemptions. And, and they don't typically review the footage then write their reports. They yeah. write their reports and then the footage gets processed and then it comes out. Yeah, they don't have access to it. Right. Is... So that if you, if you see in the report that the officer said, oh, you know, I'll... I had my taser in my pocket the whole time. It just happened to go off and shoot him right in the nipples. No, that, there's a body cam footage that shows you aiming your, your taser and shooting the guy in the chest. That's different, you know. That's what it's there for. It's for accountability. I mean, the but to be fair, if it hit both their nipples, the guy would have had to been pressing them up. I see how small that prong is. That's uh, fine, too. I, get me, officer. No, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, yeah, so we, 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 we agree on that. And maybe this shouldn't be, you know, posted a, as a debate, but a discussion about why it's important that we do hold these people accountable. You know, yeah. they're they're be, they're making money. They're not doing it for me and you. They're doing it for themselves. You because you know what? They don't post. They don't post the good interactions. I mean, not, it's yeah. not that every single interaction with them is bad. If it is, that's a problem on them, not the police officers. Because police officers are individual people too. Well, your interaction with one isn't going to be the same as the other. So if you have 99 videos on your, on your YouTube and 99 of them are all horrible interactions with the cops, then the chances are you're cherry-picking the videos yeah. that you're posting so that you can sensationalize the, the actions of the police and, and the violation of your freedom of, of speech because it does happen. Yeah. I mean, these people are pushing cops just like you said. They have faulty memories. They don't always act in the best interest because they're humans. They make decisions in the moment. We expect them to. Right. We should expect them to. That's their job. But they're also humans. You've got to accept that a certain percentage of cops are going to make a bad, a, a bad call, even if the idea is not hate-filled, even if the idea is not to violate civil rights, even if the idea is just in the moment, I believe this to be illegal and I'm going to make an action on it. I'm not 100% behind the cops being totally intrusive. I don't believe in stop and, and ID, like, hey, come yeah, here, let me, let me see your, your ID, sir. No, in Texas, you ain't, you ain't seeing shit. Have I committed a, a crime? No? Then you, that's my right to say no to you, and I'm going to use my right, because if you don't use your rights, you will lose them. Right. The, the only two ways to lose rights is to not use them and to abuse them. The rights are there for you. Except, love them and enjoy them. Don't, don't take advantage of them to, to the extent that you're taking away rights from other people. Don't be that jackass because that's affecting me, not just you. If, if you're the one that does it, for instance, yeah. not anybody yeah. individual. but The royal you. Yeah, they, yes, exactly. Um, but that's, that's the whole argument. That's my whole position on that. A lot of people think I'm, oh, you're just 100% boot licking the police officer. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? Like, I've, I've never, I don't go around just making, you know, blanket statements that every cop is good. There are bad cops, sure. I've, I've experienced them in my life, but not every cop is bad. Just like there's bad, there, there's bad people everywhere. Of any, You can intersectionalize as much as you want down to one group, and you can go, well, there's bad people in that group, and that does not define the entire group. Just like, the, you know, taking society and say, these are the peace officers. Why are they called peace officers if... Every officer's a bad guy. Why are they called peace officers then? Well, they're not. Every one of them's not a bad guy. We just get sensationalized because these YouTubers and these people are not getting you. They're not going to keep you for the 38 minutes of you having a positive interaction with the police officer. They're going to keep you with the six minutes where the police officer's beating the shit out of them because that they push the police officer just a bit too far. And you know what? 90% of the time, the police officers are in the wrong. Morally, I believe them to be in the right. Legally, they're in the wrong, and they violated rights. 
And that's what I'm saying. It's eventually going to go to the Supreme Court because somebody's going to say, man, come on, this is bullshit. I'm done with it. I'm done with it. I'm done with it. Put it to the state courts, and it's going to go to state to district, and district to Supreme. And once it gets to the Supreme Court, that's when they're going to lay out blanket statements to say, this is what you're allowed to do under freedom of press, and this is what you're not. This is what you're allowed to say under freedom of speech. This is what you're not. This is what you're allowed to believe under your freedom of religion. This is what you're not. I don't want to see that. I want to see all of us be free. Freedom of thought's a fucking amazing thing. Being able to speak my mind right here, this is beautiful. This does not happen in China. No. Not at all. I would also like to say a friend of mine, uh, Devin Tracy, always says, what, anytime you're looking at a video, what you're not seeing is as important as what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's always something that happened before. It, sometimes there's literally different angles that give yeah. you a completely different perspective on it. But even when, like, just think about all the times you saw a video and then another angle gave you another perspective when you only have one video. Just because you have one video doesn't mean the whole range of what happened is contained in there. And like, there's always right. more context. There's always a bunch of different things. And about bad cops, there, there's the good cops, bad cops, but there's also good cops that are having, like, a bad day. Any one of us has phoned in a day at work or had a bad day at work or a mistake at work. It's just when you're a police officer and you're having a bad day and you have a slip up, somebody could die yeah, in that somebody scenario. Else could be or, like you could wrongfully arrest somebody and ruin their life or any number of things. And also, there's a ton of cops wearing body cams. There's everyday interactions that are benign, mundane all the time that we don't see because they don't make news. And we also have news media that even when there's heroic actions, like that, that crazy video of the, the plane that crashed on the track in L.A., where the LAPD goes and they pull that guy out, and then the plane gets hit by a train. It's insane. It's all caught on video. Even that comes out of the news in like a week. So just remember, anytime one specific case is being lingered on, we're in a nation of 300 million people. It's yeah. like It could be a really bad case. It could be deserving of punishment, anger, scorn, and all that. But 300 million people, like thousands, hundreds of thousands of police interactions a day, like you have to put everything into its proper context. Right. Like, right. And yeah, so 99 police, bad police interactions. I like this bad. guy, guys. Uh, just so y'all know, I like this guy. He actually has a good, good head on him. At least for freedom of speech. I'm not sure what I, your other beliefs don't want to make any assumptions. But I could have a conversation with this guy. So at least so it could, you know how, why? Because of freedom of speech. Because we have that right. We have the right to discuss these ideas without fear from the government walking through that door and putting us in handcuffs because we don't agree with them. Or saying that, you know, you don't agree with this president or the last president. Whatever the case may be, you two guys might, you might support this president, you might support the last president, and y'all might get into a verbal argument. Well, guess what? In China, the one who supported the last president, he goes to jail. Yep. You don't because you support the party. Yep. And that, we don't want that. We need freedom of expression here. We need for the right to speak. Anything we want, our mind, to speak it. So. We, we should stop being so afraid of the other side that we think that any moment, if we don't like, if we don't take authoritarian control, like, you know, you got to take control of the empire to prevent them from taking control of the empire. Thank yeah. God we don't live in a nation right, yeah. that is like that. Let's like, make sure our tyrant is the tyrant and yeah. keep, keep that yeah, tyrant. Like, well. I got to crush you before you crush me. Like, we, thankfully, we don't live in a place like that. And there are a lot of people try to sell you, like, doom and gloom and, like, every presidential election is the most important one. That's all propaganda. Oh. I've been hearing it ever since I was a kid. Like, I'm a libertarian, yeah. so I don't really... I'm, I'm actually very libertarian as yeah, well. Yeah, I don't... That's why I believe in freedom of speech, because, man, I don't want the government to me what the fuck I can say and can't say. Fuck that. Mm. I don't want YouTube to tell me what I can say and can't say. I don't want YouTube to tell me I can't call someone stupid for fucking not believing science. But you know what? YouTube has to do what it has to do to protect the masses, and I understand that from a private business perspective. But from a government perspective, I don't. That's why we're like, hey, look, there's presidents from both sides, and you could have your disagreements, but it's not the end of the world, because libertarians never win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that's what that's well, the perspective you gotta have you can't be like go get them yes. crush them well you think this is a good place in that argument then sure in this talk because it wasn't arguing I mean, we had minor minor dis disagreements yeah. but nothing I think we both agree uh, about the importance of the first amendment and I think we can both agree that um, that there are people and there are actions out there that can lead to restrictions that are absolutely the most important things to, to us as people to not lose. Never lose your right to freedom of speech, your right to freedom uh, to believe. I don't care what, I'm, I'm an atheist. 
I still believe you should have the right to believe to be a Christian. I still believe you you should have the right to to you know hold anarchist thoughts and anarchist beliefs. You know that's your your deal. So. I'm an atheist too, so like this is. Are <laughs> <laughs> we know? brothers? <laughs> what do you know? Um, all right, well, hey. Yeah, it's a pleasure, pleasure talking you. with you, and thank you guys for listening, man. Are awesome. we going to take uh, questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anybody has it? All righty. Yeah, Same yeah, so. rules as before, so. So my only thing. Up, you come up here between the cameras just so we can get the recording. I kind of disagree a little bit about your take on that it's okay for YouTube to censor in like a legal sense because the First Amendment doesn't apply to them just right. because of Section 230 yeah, yeah. that treats them as, you know, a platform, not a publisher because they're actually sure. a publisher, right? So do you think that should be repealed and if they're going to well, be censoring? So yes and no. I think there should be an audit on the um, on people that are under protection of Section 230 like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. They should be audited because there is... Regardless of what anybody wants to say, me, me sitting in the middle and being able to look back at shit that's going on, I can tell you there's an obvious bias towards political belief when it comes to censorship on private platforms. Now, the, there's two arguments to that, and you've made one of them a, a good argument against, right? The argument for is that there is some responsibility to YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook to provide safe information to the people. You know, For instance, the vaccine stuff. You, know, you don't want... You don't want somebody saying they are a doctor and they, because, well, because like we were saying, there's yeah. licensing that's required for lawyering and doctoring. So when someone says, I'm a doctor and here's this, this thing, when they're not a doctor, they can cause harm to people who would believe in that because they hold the title of doctor. Or what if they are a doctor? I don't believe that they should be censored if they are okay. a doctor. Um, but Section 230 it, while it does protect them from being responsible of the, uh, responsible um, as a publisher instead of a platform. I mean, right. not held responsible as a platform instead of being held responsible as a publisher, actually holding the publisher responsible. I think that's important because that gives us the platform to spread our, our freedom of speech around. So 230 is important. There needs to be an audit to make sure that 230 is being applied properly, and I don't want to see any service take away terms of service, any um, uh, social media take away terms of service. Maybe go back and readjust them and say, don't, don't be so hard on, on ideas you're not either politically or scientifically uh, in agreement with as a platform. But at the same time, you know, you have to still be there to protect people from saying that they're a doctor when they're not a doctor and giving right. bad information so that people don't take that advice under the assumption that they're a doctor giving medical advice. Right. Well, that's that is a separate thing with the with them because you can't like actually impersonate a doctor like that's a separate crime. And all is that. it? I, I was completely but, unaware. I see it all the time. <laughs> but for Section two thirty, and I I agree with you in in some regards, but the law doesn't bear out like the point that it it doesn't bear out what it should. So Section two thirty was put forward because people would leave comments on websites, and then people could sue the uh, the website. Right for that commenter and they would win in court. So they put this section in in order to protect the web like the websites from because they could not possibly moderate all this content. However, there's no like clear definition of platform versus publisher. It's very broad and even in in the in the section where it lists off a few things and then says otherwise objectionable content, there's like a little comma that says including constitutionally protected uh, content. Right? Now like the argument that I've always made and I think this makes legal sense and I've seen the court talk about this with other types of laws is that they name like lewd conduct, uh, violent conduct, they list off a bunch of things and then they say or otherwise objectionable that that sentence or otherwise objectionable can't mean literally anything and everything like these companies have interpreted it to be because if it could there's no point in listing off anything else. However, right. the courts are like broadly over interpreting that and the spirit of 230 was to allow open discourse. But legally, the way the courts have, have uh, interpreted that portion of the statute means that we're totally out of it. So I wouldn't repeal Section 230. I would just clarify that you're listing off things and otherwise objectionable is meant to be like things that may not be specifically lewd, but not specifically violence or, or whatever. But it's not meant to be literally anything and everything. And the authors of it said, this is for an open dialogue. Like that would be like the purpose of the law, not passed into the law, yeah. like on the internet. And that's just... So it's a weird spot. We need 230, some version of it, because the internet can't exist. If 
if I can put something stupid on a Facebook post and you could sue Facebook, Facebook's going to shut down because they have billions of users. Yeah. They can't moder like they can't moderate it. Even the New York Times can't function in that way, and they are a publisher, but they're not responsible for their comments because that's part of their like platform that they're allowing you to comment on their articles. If that were not there, we would be we wouldn't be able to have the internet. Like it just would not like because you wouldn't be able to interact because Discord would be responsible for any dumb thing that you said. So like it's so the legal lees don't really bear it out. I think a revision, but not a repeal, would be something to look at. Yeah, and I agree. You know, hundred percent with what you said. That the revision part is it, it's overdue uh, because we we're in a constantly dynamically changing environment, and what is controversial today is not going to be controversial in a year. And instead of having you know instead of a, saying well you know two thirty was meant for this or for that because of how it happened back in the day, and now they're trying to apply it to ideas that were never really covered by 230, were never really discussed for 230's purposes. I do believe there's over-censorship, but I also, I, I just look back and say, but there's terms of service. You know, they tell us that, we sign them. You know, we want to use that platform as a, a method to get our freedom of speech out, but we do sign. Everybody that creates the channel signs that terms of service to agree to those rules. So it's, it's kind of a slippery slope where you say, are, is the terms of service there because it's being um, it's being influenced by the government's you know section two thirty and, and maintaining they have to write their terms of service so that they can still be you know two thirty compliant um, you know that's there, there's just so much to discuss there but he's right it needs to be rewritten it needs to be audited uh, the the people that fall under the umbrella need to be made sure that the purpose of two thirty is being properly used and it's not being used to uh, to validate censorship. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Yeah, he said he agrees with me. I agree with him. He started speaking. You sure? First, don't, so. You sure you don't want to take thirty seconds to agree? With me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, you agree with me. No, no I, and I, and like, like I said, there's there's one more thing related to two thirty that I I can't quite. Oh, here we go. Uh, and there is like a great hypocrisy in the way that we talk about like the Russians buying like Facebook ads, like one hundred and seventy thousand rubles. When, um, and you could not like any of these people, but like Sargon of Akkad, Tommy Robinson, and all these people ran for parliament in the UK, Twitter banned them. Right. Like, so like they take, Facebook takes 170,000 rubles from Russia, and that's distorting our election. Right. But this American company bans like a meant to be a social media influence campaign, like yeah. legitimate candidates. I think Tommy Robinson almost won. Mm -hmm. Like he was cl way closer than Sargon. Sorry, sorry, Sargon. Uh, I actually like Sargon. Yeah, he's, he's a sweet guy. Speaks his mind. You know, freedom of speech. Yeah. You got to enjoy somebody that, that enjoys his freedom of speech. But he didn't, he didn't come close to winning. Sorry, <laughs> Sargon, for reminding Poor you guy. of that. But uh, Tommy Robinson, but regardless of whether or not they came close to winning, they were banned by like a foreign company and nobody talks about how that's election interference. Yeah. Like for, even if you're saying because what it's they not happening in America, but, it's but even if there. you but like they they have foreign shareholders in those companies, they're publicly yeah. traded companies. Like you like if Russia bought a bunch of stock in Twitter and then started banning American mm -hmm. politicians they didn't like, that would be fine. But if they advertise on those social media websites, then that's a huge deal. <laughs> like it's ridiculous. Right. But, yeah. By the way, bad advertisements for broken English. Like if you ever read any of them, <laughs> oh, we deal with our Russian bots in the chat all the time. All right, well, hey, man. Uh, do you have any more questions? Anybody? I got one. Yeah, sure. You guys talked about the Constitution a bit. Are you for uh, ritualism or a living Constitution? Oh, I, I believe that there's a, there is room for eventually coming finding a new Constitution that's more, uh, more dated, more uh, modern day. Um, I don't believe in a complete rewriting of the Constitution because I think throwing away several of the, the amendments that we have in there are pretty important. Um, one, of the, one of the amendments that bothers me to this day is the 13th Amendment. Everybody goes, the 13th Amendment? How can you be bothered with the abolishment of slavery, right? Well, slavery was only abolished for a certain number of people in this country. It says in the 13th Amendment that if, you are, if you're a captive, if you're a prisoner of this country, which is every felon that's in prison right now, you don't fall under that protection. Right. You don't fall under the 13th Amendment. You can be treated like a slave. In fact, here in Texas, they do slave labor. They put people out on farms. They make them work for, for food to be fed that night. It's fucked up. It's privately owned shit, too. It's fucked up here in Texas. So yes, we do need a new, a new constitution. 
but we don't need to get rid of the old one. We just need a more modern one. Yeah. But there's a process for that to have a convention in the states and amend it. We don't need to absolutely. I, I'm, well, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm in favor of that, but I believe it's you you have to if you're really talking about change, you've got to change more than just one amendment. You got to change. You got to modernize all amendments. They didn't have cell phones when they wrote the Constitution. Right. You know, that's, they, just, that's just a dangerous idea to me. Well, it is a dangerous idea, and that's why I said we don't. We shouldn't do it now. Um, definitely not now. But there, there needs to be, with time, there needs to be a more modern Constitution that that really takes into account things like privacy. You know, we didn't consider privacy a thing because back in the day there were no telescopic lenses that could take pictures from 100 meters away right into your. Uh, bathroom while you're using the bathroom. Nobody considered that. The, the Constitution wasn't written like that. Right. We wrote in um, wiretapping laws eventually. But there needs to be, the, why does the Constitution have to be amended for the wiretapping laws? Why can't we have a Constitution that already takes that into account? Well, you, you can pass laws like on the state and federal level without amending the Constitution to certain aims. Um, but like I, I'm not for the living constitution. I'm for like a, I'm of the belief that a living constitution is a dead constitution. Yeah. Like if you have a piece of text, it has to mean like the words have to mean what they mean when they were written. Yeah. And there's actually a good argument about whether or not it's like to me the the living constitution is not interesting at all. Like it's just it, that means you could change it whenever you want, and it's like whatever, whatever. I think the interesting discussion is whether or not your uh, like original like intent, like a textualist versus like uh, just straight up an original intent. Because you can go by the text and then you can end up with decisions where like the 14th Amendment was really written for black people. Like the citizenship guarantee in it was written for black people that were freed as slaves. Like that's the original intent. If you're going based on that, that's where it applies. However, like if you go by the text, it says if you were born in the United States and or its territories, you are a citizen of the United States. And the, what that ends up granting us is birthright citizenship. It's mm -hmm. technically in the text, it's just, but that wasn't the original intent. And that's how you get all these different, like, you know, the term anchor babies, that's where it comes from, like, yeah. these people that move here supposedly to do this. So, like, th that's a big deal, whether or not you have birthright citizenship or not, like, for anybody going forward. But, like, that's a more interesting conversation because you can make sound legal arguments for both if you're looking at the text. And I, so like that's more interesting than a living constitution. Like it, there are amendments in order to change stuff. I do think persons, papers, and belongings should cover wiretapping on its own with the Fourth yeah. Amendment. And um, I think the third party carrier thing is something that needs to be addressed where uh, in like 1980 something, they said, because like nobody had like all these fancy bank accounts and credit cards and all that, the court said that the government doesn't need a warrant for that. But now everything and anything we do is digitally held by third parties. Yeah. And if they don't need a warrant for that, then those companies could just turn them over. Then, like, we have no, effectively, we have no Fourth Amendment. So right. I think that needs to be, that decision needs to be re-examined. Like, yeah. So I hope that answered your question from mine. I'm not, I didn't really answer the living constitution part, just the, I believe there should be, the, I believe in traditional constitutional, a traditional constitution, but I think it should be more modernized uh, to account for all of us today. We're, we're totally different than they were 200 years ago. And if we don't start making these changes soon and we're modernizing them soon, then in 100 years, they're going to be 300 plus years removed from the Founding Fathers writing the Constitution. It's, you're really putting a lot of faith that it's going to go your way. You could rewrite it and they could restrict freedom of speech. So that's no, no, for sure, for really sure. But, but I think that the idea is if you actually, if you take into account that, uh, that certain things are important, you know, like it, the Founding Fathers could have written in the idea that no freedom of speech ever would exist, you know, that all speech should be, uh, should have been restricted, and we would have had a, had a government that arose from that. So you're absolutely right in that, and, but I think that a government that arises from a restriction of freedom of speech is a government that's already doomed to fail, mm -hmm. because it's going to inspire uprisings in the people, and the people are going to come, and they will eventually overthrow the government, then you're back to an anarchical society, or whatever government moves in, you know, if they have a, uh, a, like a militarized government that moves in or takes it over or whatnot. But I think when you write a good constitution, you end up with a country that's as free as we are today. And that's part of the basis of the constitution that we have and the amendments that were already put forth. I think anybody that's serious about doing this at a top political level will already understand the value of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom of press. Even if they do restrict us as a people, 
from being able to do First Amendment audits with a new modern constitution, it's still going to be there with the idea that we as a people are free to express what we want to express with limitation. But you would, already you have would, that anyway. You wouldn't do a page one rewrite. You would like amend it over time. Yes. Yeah. That's why I say it's, it's something that would happen over time to, to get a completely modernized constitution. But it's not – I mean when you're talking about this, you're, it's, you're kind of almost like speculating on an impossible idea. Yeah. You know, like how would this work? Well, it wouldn't, you know. How would, it, how would it instituting UBI work into a system that's already capitalist? Let's say a, a whole nation decides we're going to go UBI. How do we just immediately go December 31st, 2021, no UBI, January 1st, 2022, UBI? It doesn't work that way. It's, a, it's, it's an integration. And a constitution, a, a revisioned constitution, a severely revisioned constitution would never happen overnight. It would happen over time and would it would be almost impossible to, to happen. You know, that's just speculation, you know, uh, fantastical if, speculation, if you want to say. If, if somebody called the Constitutional Convention tomorrow, like, I'm not one of those doom and gloom, <coughs> like, there's a civil war upon us, but I think that would be, that would be, like, the trigger point, because yeah. everybody would be like, they're going to come for your guns. Like, you have Alex Jones on the radio, like, they're, get, get out of there. I love my guns, though. Yeah, so. yeah. but that's what they would, that's what they Texas, I love them. No, no, I'm not, I'm, but I'm saying those people would be super worried about them declaring a, a constitutional convention. I would, I, I, would, I think yeah. anybody would be, we're going to rewrite the whole thing. Yeah. With like, As a freedom of speech advocate, I'd be severely concerned. I'd want to be a part of that talk, because... I would want them to understand that the position of the people who hold my my beliefs and you know with me having a platform that I do I should I would want to speak up for the people that don't have platforms and say look give us the freedom of speech just allow us to be able to discuss your ideas so that we can make sure that you aren't coming in here and doing exactly what England tried to do to us in the, in the late 1700s. And it, it has to be done over time, and history shows us it's done over time, except for the Bill of Rights. Yeah. It seems like any the most any generation <laughs> could get is like three amendments. Yeah. Like that's Even after the Civil War, like one of the most destructive like events, in, probably the most destructive event in American history, like the, our, our deadliest war, three amendments. Like yeah. that, that's it. That's yeah. your maximum. Like, and then you got to wait for the next generation and all that. And, th and that's with, like, a couple goofy vice presidential amendments <laughs> that are, like, like kind of no-brainers. Like. Yeah. Well, it's great. like I said, I got a great conversation. You got a question? No. Appreciate all right. It. Well, thank, thank you both for yeah. doing this. Thank you specifically for stepping up, coming in here mm -hmm. uh, last minute. Yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, Later on, what it is, Alex did text me. He's at the Cowboys game, which is why he's <laughs> not here. I'm telling so, you guys... He's probably not there, okay? He was scared. I'm telling you, he scared me because I had him in a, in a debate and I made him look stupid <laughs> and I was very aggressive with him. Same way I use, I don't know, do you know Nathan Thompson is? Uh, so, I don't know. I might know. Flat that. earther, yeah. right? I had a live debate with him and Wait, you're a rounder? Terrifying. Huh? You're a rounder? I'm a rounder, yeah. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a globe tard. That's what, that's what we call it. So. Um, but no, I, I, I had a debate with him in person on, on a at a tattoo shop local uh, to here, and I, like, just shit all over it. He wouldn't look me in the eyes the whole time he was like this. You been and to a tattoo shop? I was going to say that. You like tattoo? You like tattoo? A little bit. But it, it was funny, the one time, um, there, we were sitting there, and you can see in the debate, he's, like, got something on his phone, and he's talking about some evidence on his phone, and I'm like, dude, I can't fucking see what you're talking about, man. And he's like, here. And he naturally just reached out like that. And I naturally went for the phone. And he looked up at me like, don't hit me. Don't hit me. <laughs> he had this look on his face like, oh my gosh. And I was like, come on, man. We're on camera. I ain't going to hit yeah, you. Yeah, I'm not going to hit you. Don't <laughs> jail for that shit on camera until this shit goes off. <laughs> but I was in a mankini that night. Oh, my I wore, God. I debated him in a mankini. <laughs> for for memorability, a me memor you know that's how serious we take the flat Earth where I come from. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and last chance. Any questions? If not, thank you very much yeah. for yeah. being here. Thank you. Thank you.